We took off. We were probably uh, 200 feet in the air. The wheels were coming up, and the engine quit. The engine quit, and we've got 10,000 pounds of explosives under the wings, and we're only a couple hundred feet in the air. And I figured, we're going to hit the ground here pretty soon. The pilot looked over at me, and he said, my eyes were like saucers. He reached over and he pulled the lever that jettisons all of the ordnance. And as that ordnance left the aircraft, and it kind of jumped up a little bit from the loss of weight, the engine started again. And he started to climb up to what we call the low key position, a position where if it quits again, you could probably glide to a landing or bail out. He was pulling up to that position, and sure enough, the engine quit again. I'm ready to, I'm reaching for the handle, ready to pull the handle to eject from the aircraft. It started up again. He put the wheels down and continued the right turn back toward the runway. We landed, and the engine quit again, and this time it didn't start anymore. Ride number one. <laughs> That was my first ride in the airplane in my combat checkout. I'm a service brat. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. I've lived in many places, uh, seen, seen many things, had a lot of experience that a lot of kids my age didn't have. When I was just five years old, I was living in Japan, uh, going to school in Japan. Lived there for a year and a half, 1948 to 50, during the occupation, which was quite an experience, and then again, 1957 to 1960. We moved to uh, Andrews Air Force Base right outside of Washington, D.C. So I had the unique experience of beginning high school right outside of Tokyo and finishing high school right outside of Washington, D.C. Was uh, number two, on the list for the Air Force Academy. I was an alternate. I never did get that. My dad said, uh, hey, have you ever thought about a and I said, no, why? He says, uh, actually, uh, a and has produced more officers for the military than all of the other service academies combined. He says, uh, that'll give you some standing, some prestige among the uh, people that make the selections uh, for uh, officers and pilots. I said, cool. I applied, I was accepted. The fall of 1962, I was off to a and and joined the Corps of Cadets. I graduated in uh, January 1967, and by March 1967, I was on my way to Del Rio, Texas, to Laughlin Air Force Base to Air Force pilot training. At that time, the Air Force uh, was using the T-41, which is Cessna 172, for uh, kind of a, an orientation course. It was uh, kind of a screening program. They want to see if I can use a checklist and follow their instructions. I could. No problems in that course. T-37, a uh, little bit different. Now you had to have a helmet on, an oxygen mask on, uh, jet engines. Really enjoyed the T-37. One day, a group of us were sitting around in the Memorial Student Center drinking coffee. We happened to open a newspaper up, and here was a picture 
uh, from Vietnam of a squadron of people standing out in front of an A-1 Sky Raider. 50-foot wingspan, big engine, lots of bombs, real macho airplane, you know. And uh, I got to looking at that A-1. I said, you know, I want to fly that. That's what I want to do. And in pilot training at that time, we had what was called a merit assignment system. Basically, whatever your grade points are from the various check rides and academics and everything, uh, add up to your relative standing in the class. I was number one flying and number three overall. So I was going to get my choice. You have to remember at that time, the Air Force touted itself as an all-jet Air Force. And here is a propeller-driven airplane, and I wanted it, and I got it. While I was in training for that airplane down in Florida, uh, the, obviously the subject came up, what base do you want to go to? The airplane was only flown in Southeast Asia, only flown uh, in the Southeast Asia War. There was one base in Thailand and one base in Vietnam. Well, I went with the advice of my dad. He said, son, if you've got to go to that war, be a gentleman. Go to Thailand. Live in an air-conditioned hooch. I did. I went to Thailand. I went to the 602nd Fighter Squadron. In addition to the standard uh, missions that you would expect of that type airplane, ground attack, close air support, that squadron was designated the search and rescue squadron for the Air Force. They were the Sandys. The 602nd Sandys were the fighter escort for the Jolly Green rescue helicopters. And uh, I ended up in that squadron. And I immediately realized that this is going to be a big role right here. This is going to be big shoes to fit into. 32, rolling in hot. Most of our operations were to be in Laos, um, mostly in northern Laos, some in southern Laos. The southern Laos was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and some into the edge of North Vietnam. I had been selected to be one of the night pilots. Uh, the night pilots, uh, we would go as a two-ship formation. We would go up into northern Laos, going up there one night and on one of those routine missions, before we even took off, uh, we got a radio call from the command post saying, okay, scrub your regular mission We've got an outpost under attack that needs air support. So we were diverted to that. We took off, I was the flight lead. We got airborne and during the climb out, my wingman called me and said that his engine was overheating. I told him to reduce power, slow down, turn around and go back to the base. He did so. Again, it's night. I went over, I circled the area, they fired a few flares for me to eliminate the area where the uh, North Vietnamese were attacking from. Uh, so I laid some ordnance there. But I had just so much ordnance and I was there by myself, didn't have another clean load of ordnance with me. Uh, so I had to kind of sparse it out, you know, single bomb, a single rocket, a single string of CBU into the position there. When I'd make a strafing pass, I would just turn on one pair of guns, like the inboards, rather than turn all four guns on. So I could again conserve my ammo and space out my time on station and try to keep the attackers heads down till I could get a gunship or some 
fighters in there, some uh, F-4s with some heavy ordnance uh, to deliver. I stayed there for a long time. Uh, I got down to the point where I didn't have any ammunition left. But I still, the support aircraft that were coming up to help weren't there yet. So I started making passes on the enemy, dumping out my in empty canisters. The uh, CBU canister, uh, a fuel tank, uh, empty fuel tank, and that just making passes. I'd go down and I would drop something off the airplane. It wasn't explosive, it was just garbage, basically. But I did that uh, about a dozen times. And uh, then I resorted to lowering my landing gear and making passes and flashing my lights at them to maybe they think I'd shooting a Z-ray at them or something, I don't know. The relief finally came, I left. Uh, I got credit uh, later uh, that week, got word that uh, the, the attack was repulsed. I got credit for saving that outpost. Uh, I also got in trouble. I had gotten back from that mission and I'm back in my rack, take, I'm, I'm asleep. Security police knocked on the door. Lieutenant Beggarly? Yeah? Squadron commander wants to see you. Yes, sir. You went up last night by yourself without your wingman, is that right? Yes, sir. Against squadron policy? Yes, sir. They needed help. You made 51 passes against the enemy at night alone? Yes, sir. Against squadron policy? Yes, sir. They needed help. I got a silver star. <laughs> it was very common at that time, especially in Vietnam, but also in Laos, if a close air support mission came up, that is, ground forces under attack, or if a rescue mission came up, uh, air crew down, all other operations ceased, just stopped right there, and everything was diverted to those efforts, close air support and search and rescue. That to me was, I think, an amazing instance of how that war was conducted. Everybody realized by that time that just routine bombing of interdiction points, tree parks, and all of that, and it was nothing. But close air support or rescue, where we knew that people's lives, that our people's lives were in danger, the effort went there. One of the missions of the 602nd was to be the armed escort for the Jolly Green helicopters, combat search and rescue. When, when, a, when an aircraft had gone down, when there was a known survivor, somebody talking on the radio, calling, hey, I'm down here, I'm down here. Then the rescue effort would be mounted. The A1s generally would go into the area first. Two A1s to go into the immediate area and locate the survivor. We called them Sandy Low Lead, Sandy Two, Low Element. Uh, their job was to find that survivor, assess the situation, neutralize the threat, and determine if it would be safe for a helicopter to come in and go to a hover, its most vulnerable position. The second element, the Sandy Three and Four, were to be in reserve in case the lead element had to leave, but they would also be the kind of the cover for the helicopters while they were holding back and away from the survivor area. A lot of the time, the low element was doing what we called trolling, getting the enemy to fire at you. 
so we could assess their strength, see, see what they've got down there. On this particular mission, it was in an area right in the center of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's called Chapon. An F-4 uh, had gone in uh, the night before. The back seater had gotten out of the airplane. Front seater apparently went in with the airplane, uh, never did get voice contact from him. But the back seater had gotten out and was talking to uh, the uh, rescue coordination, and it was decided to launch a search effort. First element went in to start assessing the situation. And right off the bat, the number two airplane was shot down. The pilot got out. When he extracted from his aircraft, he landed in the only tree on this one hillside. The search and rescue effort switched from the F-4 backseater, who seemed to be in a fairly good position, to this rescue pilot, who was in a very bad position. As we approached the area, we were told that uh, the lead element has to pull out and that we were now designated the low element. About that time, Leeds radio failed. We have three radios in the uh, A1. The survivor is on a UHF frequency. The Leeds radio that failed was his UHF. So he couldn't talk to the survivor. So he called up to me on the side radio and said, okay, you're lead now. And we changed places. I went down there and I started ass assessing the situation. On one of my passes, I saw a North Vietnamese gun crew in their pit with a 37 millimeter gun. I had a flight of two F-105s come in, make one pass. Each one of them dropped six 750 pound bombs. That hole went away. I brought the Jolly Greens in. The survivor on the ground popped his smoke. The Jolly Green goes over to where the pilot is, puts down the hoist, picks him up, and as they were getting out of there, a 23 millimeter uh, gun opened up and knocked the tail rotor out. So the helicopter lost control, went sideways uh, into a kind of gentle landing in the side of a hill. Okay, so now those four guys plus the survivor are on the ground there. So we've got to get them out. Brought in some more jets, neutralized that gun position and another one. And then the second Jolly Green came in and picked up all of those people and got out of there. By that time, I was out of ammunition. I was out of fuel. It's time for us to leave. And so I called in another set of A1s to take our position. But I'd gotten my part of it done there. Later on, they did get the F-4 pilot out of there. The man who commands most of the secret army is General Bang Pao. He is a Hmong tribesman who worked closely with the CIA in organizing the Hill People. General Bang Pao was uh, going to attempt to take back uh, some strategic high ground. And this was going to be a full-scale infantry attack up a hill. And we were to support this infantry charge up this mountain. I was in the second element. Even just getting into the area and looking down to see where everything was, we started getting ground fire from uh, heavy machine guns. And Lead said he spotted one of the positions. So he said, okay, just jump on my wing and we'll make a formation firing pass. He started firing. He's about maybe 75 feet over to my right. 
one of the cannon shells exploded in his wing. The fire uh, from the burst cannon shell is, had burst hydraulic lines, and so you got high pressure hydraulic fluid feeding this fire. You can see half his wing is on fire. I said, okay, climb and turn right. That's a safe bailout or safer bailout here back toward the friendlies. So we pull up and he says, I gotta go. So he is ejected from the airplane. His left wing crumbled and the airplane rolled toward me. It went over the top of my airplane. I was looking up into his empty cockpit as it went by. So this flaming thing goes off over here to crash. And then I look back at him and he's in a parachute and the parachute malfunction the, it's what we call the May West. One of the riser lines had gone over the chute. So instead of making one big mushroom shaped chute, it's like a figure eight, okay? Two smaller chute and it's spinning. And I'm flying beside him. I look over and I see him. I saw him cut that line and the parachute became normal again. And I saw the parachute disappear down into the clouds so he can't see which way to go so i went down with my airplane i said just listen to my motor and i'll point to the friendlies and i went by and made a pass over him headed toward the friendlies he says okay i got it and he gets out his compass and reads that direction and that's the direction he's going to go so i went back up and gave some covering fire uh, to some uh, good guys that were coming up the, the mountain trying to get over to where he was. But that was in the clear over there and he was in the fog down there. I was out of fuel, so I, I started to leave there, pulled up, but I had already uh, initiated the SAR. As I started pulling up out of there, uh, the Sandys checked in I briefed them on what was going on, where the bad guys were, fire was, where the uh, survivor was, and I left. All this sounded like it happened quickly, but it was over an hour in the target area there. I got a DFC for my efforts there in directing that search and rescue. I've flown airplanes for 40 years. I flew for a couple of years before I went in the Air Force. I flew 21 years with the Air Force. I flew 17 years with American Airlines. I flew 210 combat missions. I got hit 27 times. I never got shot down. I never lost an airplane. I was involved in 10 opposed search and rescue missions. I came away with two silver stars, six distinguished flying crosses, and 22 air medals. At times in the Air Force and in civilian flying, you come up with a situation where you are in imminent danger. A lot of times you don't think about it. I didn't think about it right then. But then afterwards, when the adrenaline slows down, you think about it. You think about how fragile we are, how close we are, and you, you, think, you think about how much you have to lose. You think about how fragile this is. 
it makes you think about some of your other values and why, you know, where you're going. So throughout my career, I've, I've had a healthy awareness that sometimes I do get some help. Some, sometimes there, there is, there, there is uh, some guidance, some protection. I mean, for goodness sakes, I lived through a night with over 1,400 rounds of anti-aircraft fire at me. I've, I've got some protection. <laughs> Yeah, and it's good to have.